Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racial lives, inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. It is a distinct pleasure to welcome to this conversation today my friend and colleague, the Reverend Dr. William Barber III, co-chair of Poor, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Today, we will discuss the upcoming election and key racial and economic issues uniting the poor and impacted communities across the country. But first, let me thank you, uh, Reverend Barber, for joining me in this conversation, even as you have had to do so in between delayed flights. And so I say to our audience that he is joining us via audio, uh, in between uh, travel uh, as I am coming through you Facebook Live video. So thank you for making a way for joining us for this important conversation. Well, thank you, Dean, and thank you for all that you do, the witness that you continue to give, the students that you prepare. You know, uh, during this COVID time, we've had to learn all kinds of ways of being in communication. Uh, I, I often think about um, Hebrews where it says in the past days, Jesus spoke, God spoke to his people in various and sundry ways. <laughs> so, exactly. So, <laughs> in a, sundry ways here going on. And I, and I greet you from repairs of the breach as well, um, and you know, which is this organization that undergirds the, the movement of the Poor People's Campaign along with the Kairos Center. And uh, just, just glad to be on with you today. Well, thank you, and thank you for the work you're doing. And let's jump right in, because I know uh, that you are on the road and uh, sort of making a way out of no way for this conversation. So I want to jump in. You often speak about the political power of the poor. Tell us what you mean by that, if you will, as well as, as we, how do we access that power when the poor in general and the black poor in particular are being disenfranchised as we speak through 21st century Jim Crow voting restrictions? Well, yeah, you know, that's a, a, a heavy question, but let me just say that it is the problem that the poor face that also point out the power that mm. the poor have. So here we are in 20, 22. And I must say, before I even say anything, I was, I got a little ticked off the other day. I was on a call with somebody mm -hmm. and they were saying, well, you know, things aren't as bad as they mm -hmm. were during segregation. And I said, that isn't even the question. That's not even what we're talking about. We, 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 we're ta we know the difference between legalized segregation and, 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 and uh, non-legalized segregation. But what we're talking about is the status, the data, right. what's going on now. So let me give the problem. First of all, the problem is that in 2022, 59 years after the March on Washington, where the agenda called for a $2 minimum wage, a universal health care, fully funded public education. Mm -hmm. And then in 68, as you know, Dr. King and, and right. welfare rights. Well, I want to say to uh, Dean, it was the welfare rights women who called Dr. King to the poor people's campaign, not vice versa. And, and, and right. so in 68, but here we are, 140 million poor and low wealth people in this nation, the so-called wealthiest nation, 140 right. million. And, it, and none of it has to exist. There's no scarcity right. of resources. Then if you break that down, 73 million women, mm. uh, 26 million black people, but that's 60.9% of all black people. That's right. 66 million white people, but that's 30% uh, of white people. Then two more things. You have 55 million people who work every day for less than a living wage. Many of them were essential workers. They were among the people who went to work the most during COVID the first and they died the first mm -hmm. as well. Then the last stat is 87 million people in this country who are uninsured or underinsured a hundred years after 
Teddy Roosevelt broke with both parties and said that one of the moral things that the nation needed to do was provide universal health care. And that's a, these are serious problems. Right. But, but inside of that is also the power because two things. Number one, all of these are policy problems, problems caused by policy. So they can be right. fixed by policy. But number two, if you flip that over, 140 million poor and low wealth people, 43% of the nation, that means that poor and low wealth people in uh, uh, so-called battleground states also now represent almost 45% of the electorate. That's right. 30% across the board. It means that there is this coalition, if mobilized, that does not have to remain disenfranchised, that does not have to remain bound by the actions of others because the stones that have been rejected have the power and the numbers now to become That's the right. chief cornerstone. And, That's it, right. and was it not like that? I'll close here. Was it not like that in, in um, the days of Pharaoh when the Pharaoh looked around and said, uh oh, the more That's we right. do, the bigger they've grown? And the, and the key for us now is to mourn over the problem. 700 poor people die every day from poverty, a quarter million a year. But then also say inside of that deep, ugly problem is all this power and potential. Right now, I read, I'm going to stop really here. North Carolina, I'm going to give you some numbers, 19%. Florida, 4%. Georgia, 7%. Pennsylvania, 4%. Michigan, 1%. What is that? That's the percentage of poor and low wealth folk who didn't, who, if they voted today, they didn't vote last time. If you could just get 19% of those who didn't vote in North Carolina, 4% in Georgia, I'm in Florida, 7% in Georgia, they could did control every election. Yeah. So how every. you, yeah, yeah. no. And, and that's the political power of the poor. Yet here's what we know. First of all, you know, as you talk about, these were the essential people, what we have to get people to under, uh, essential workers is that these are essential human beings, essential yeah, citizens, essential voters. Now, here's the thing. One of the uh, biggest threats, if you will, to a democracy uh, like ours or an aspiring democracy like ours is inequality, inequity, injustice, that you have this uh, distrib maldistribution, if you will, of 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 justice, this maldistribution of just of 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 wealth that you have the poor, and therefore you can prey upon uh, the poor and others with sort of the, the misinformation that that divides the electorate, but certainly divides the poor against itself. How in, do we begin to get uh, to get the poor to vote? Uh, for in relationship to their real be, uh, interests, real okay. best interests, yeah. self-interest, yeah. as opposed to uh, voting in a way in which uh, indeed uh, that is uh, based on the, the fears that have been nurtured. Well, you're exactly right. So let's look at it in a couple of ways. First of all, there has to come a point where you have to fight. Fred Douglas said power never concedes anything without a struggle. I mean, it was in 1850s when the Dred Scott decision came down and Frederick Douglass said, every attempt to ally the, the, the abolition movement only serves to increase and intensify our agitation. So there's a point at which now we are where we have to name the, the actions against us, but, but we have to increase our agitation as we have to reshape the narrative. Howard Thurman once said, uh, you know your power often by how much the enemy does to stop you. Right, and, so what, right. and so what we have found is, first of all, we got to tell truth and we got to organize that truth telling. That's why we have the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. That's why on June 18th of this past year, we had the Mass Poor People's Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington and to the polls. It was designed not as an end, not just as a march, but as a mass assembly to tell the truth the truth mm -hmm. about what the interlocking injustices of systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism, mm -hmm. the truth about how deadly these policies are and how you can't address one without addressing the other, 
the truth that we have to challenge both Democrats and Republicans. We have to uh, 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 never stand down on these issues. The truth that it costs more for things to stay in unequal than it does to fix it. And the truth about the power that poor and low wealth people have because many don't have that. Uh, 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 don't, don't know. And last, and last two things, the division, you're right, is intentional. Kevin Phillips told Richard Nixon in 68, uh, he said, I know how the Republican Party, he said that time, can win and control this country forever, but we must engage in intentional polarization. He That's called right. it positive polarization to pit black and white people against this. Now, why did he say that? Because Martin had said, that, that in the 1800s in the Reconstruction, it was poor and low wealth whites and blacks that came together to reshape the society. And the segregated society was born out of the Southern aristocracy's fear of the, that kind of fusion coalition. Martin said to us in 68, that, that, that the only groups that could fundamentally shift America would be for the mass of poor black people white people, indigenous people, Latino people, and labor unions and people of faith to come together. Now, the last thing, however, we also have to have to understand, and we've done studies on this. Most poor people do not, uh, that don't vote. Uh, the reason is not because of voter suppression, as ugly, vile, and illegal as that is. It is not just because they don't have transportation as, as wrong as that is. It is, they say, nobody talks to us. Right. Nobody comes to us, whether we're in Harlem or ha Harlem or Harlan County, Kentucky. And I've been in both places. <laughs> so we're starting to say, but then don't just not participate. Make them hear you. <laughs> and you right. make right. one way you make it's not the only way, but one way you make them hear you is you put a demand at the ballot box. You say our votes are not support, they are demands for policies. Right. Another way you make them hear you is being willing to put your body on the line nonviolently, so forth and so on. Then lastly, the data actually shows that when poor and low wealth people vote, they tend to vote their interests and they vote wow. for the now, now here, here's, here's the thing. You, you, you will hear that, for instance, poor, low-income white folk vote against their own interests. The data says that's actually not true. The majority mm. of poor and low wealth white people, when they vote, they vote progressive. The problem is so many don't vote. The ones that tend to vote, vote racism and vote greed are middle and upper class mm. white folks. The proud boys are not poor white folk. Right, right. Now, I right. know this because I just got on the plane. Since you asked me this, Kirsten, I, when I got on the plane in, in, in North Carolina about two hours ago, I was standing out there with my bags. A guy drove up in a probably a truck that may have cost him $140,000, $150,000. He jumps out of his truck and says, you support Trump, don't you? I said, excuse me. He said, I know you do. I know you do. He said, because I do and you do. He said, no, I know who you are. You one of those, but that's all right. Trump 24, Trump. And I just sat there and look, this is not some <laughs> poor white guy. This is some right. guy that's got this mythology in his head that by standing against voting right, standing against health care, standing against living wage, he is in fact helping himself and he's blocking us from getting something because he thinks us getting something That's is right. from getting something. But he's not poor. And That's so right. lastly, the, the thing about it is, and I want folks to hear this, that we're in a place now in this country, and from an organizing standpoint, that all you need is a remnant. You don't mm -hmm. even need 30% right. of poor and low wealth people to, to turn right. out that didn't have a turnout. There's not a state in this country where if 25% of poor and low wealth voters who have not voted were organized in a moral fusion voting collective that that power block could not fundamentally shift the electorate from Mississippi to Maine, from New York to, to New Mexico, from Arizona to Alabama. I, the data is there and we've actually put it in a thing called uh, unleashing the, power, the, the sleeping giant. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, waking the sleeping giant and unleashing the power. And you know what, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Douglas? Most political consultants are ignoring this data. Yeah. On both sides of the aisle. And that's shameful that they are. 
So, so you have said so much, Bishop Barber. I want to pick up on this, uh, this moral issue that you point. Out. I'm going to ask you two last questions to get you out of here, as I promised. And and that is, how do we get? First of all, you have rightly pointed out that it's not completely voter suppression why people don't vote. It's it's because they aren't their issues aren't being spoken to and their realities. Yet we do know that uh, voter suppression is alive and well mm-hmm. and kicking. And you have pointed out that in every state that is a racist voter suppression state is also a high poverty state. That's right. how, do, how do we get, in particularly the faith community, you know, you talk about <clears throat> what politicians aren't paying attention to, but how do we get more in the faith community to view not only voter suppression, but voter turnout, that all of these issues about which you were speaking as not a polit- simply a political issue, but a moral issue. Or, how, or, how, how do we or move at least that? in God politics, Jesus right. politics. Right, Let, well, you know, Jesus was political. <laughs> that's right, very much so. Let, let's start with Genesis and suggest that voting is a gift from God. Mm-hmm. Voting is not a gift of the Constitution. It's a gift from God. God gave humanity the right to vote, to choose in the Garden of Eden. If you look at that, if, if you look at the uh, original biblical story, however you believe it as a story or actually happened, the bottom line is God gave humanity koil. In Hebrew, the word is koil, K-O-L or Q-O-L, which means voice and vote. That separates us from animals. So anybody that tries to suppress your right to vote is not just a racist, they are an idolatrist. Mm -hmm. Because what they are trying to do is to suggest that you are not human. Mm -hmm. You're not made in the Imago Dei, because to be made in the Imago Dei is to be given the ability to choose. Mm -hmm. So the church has to lift it up in that way. Now, 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 if in fact you you're doing it for racial stand, racist reasons, and you know voter suppression often targets black people. Mm-hmm. But today's voter suppression may target black people. But when we won the biggest case against modern day Jim Crow was the NW, North Carolina NAACP versus McCory. When we sued, we showed how it was uh, that that their laws were racist, class based, also mm-hmm. uh, affect, affected women and students. In other words, we showed that they engaged in racism with surgical uh, precision, but that surgical precision toward black people had collateral damage on Latinos, on Asians, on natives, on white people, on poor whites, and on uh, uh, students and on the disabled. And you have to do that because sometimes what gets us where we need to be is to show people. I went to Harlan County, Kentucky, and, and, and people said, you go down there, Folk going to hurt you because that's where the Hatfields and the McCoys are. I say, yes, but that's also where Justice Harlan came from, who was the only justice that that voted against Plessy versus Ferguson. That's right. Uh, that's I mean, right. Uh, um, separate but equal. He was, he was white, but he was, fr- and he, in fact, he had a black, uh, um, what I under, I've learned since, he had a black half brother, but mm. he was the only one, Justice Harlan. And so, so he came from those, the song, which side are you on that the black kids sing in the street? It came out of the, the Appalachia, came from a white woman singing that song when the sheriff was after her husband for standing mm-hmm. up against the union. So here, here's my thing. We went there. And when we went there, we put a, we, we said, we, we put a map up of all of the legislators in that state that engaged in r- racist voter suppression and under the guise that they were protecting freedom. Then we put a map up of all of the per- those same legislators who were against union rights and living wages. One of the guys, white guy in the room, said, "Rev Bob, do that again." I said, "Do what?" He said, "Show us that again." I did, and 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 and, and he said, "Well, I will be damned. We being played against each other." <laughs> right. And I said, "Now, what were you going to do?" And so you know what? Those counties got together in 2018. Uh, five counties that were so-called red counties. They took this new understanding that they were being played. They had never been shown it as clearly as we showed it. They organized and they sent an incumbent uh, extremist Republican home, put in office a governor who was for living wages, for felony reenfranchisement, and for health care. So I don't talk just theory. I'm telling you Mm -hmm. that, that if we can build these coalitions, we've got to show people that the same people 
that would suppress a vote, will take your health care, will block right. your, will, will right. keep your water dirty, won't clean. The, I mean, it's right there in front of us, but we have to take the time, which is why, lastly, we wrote a piece, and I want your audience to look at it, called The Souls of Poor Folk. Mm. Audit of America for 50 years after the Poor People's Campaign. And then we laid out a 14 point agenda for the healing of the nation. And it's rooted in what we call moral an uh, uh, analysis, moral uh, articulation, and moral action. But here's one criticism that we have to say of the church. Now, 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 um, Reverend Douglas, <laughs> you are a preacher, and everybody knows at the end of the day that you do a lot of things, but you preach. And when you preach, you preach with justice and love. <laughs> and I'm a preacher. If there's anything you're supposed to do as a pastor is preach. I mean, I know yep. we do other things, but every Sunday you have a captive audience. Here's the critique and why, and, and the church has got to get better and in a hurry. Yeah. 50, the Pew Foundation did a study a few years ago, and they studied 50,000 sermons. Hmm. And then they did a chart and on what, what came up the most at what percentage. In predominantly white churches, doctrine and uh, order came up the most. In the black church, hallelujah, and uh, God, <laughs> but poverty didn't even register, mm, mm, even though poverty was mm. the first sermon Jesus talked about. That's right. That's right. And the last sermon he talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, all I... in between. And then there are 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that speak to how we are called to treat the least. Of if we That's are right. not preaching, if we are not preaching, if we are not saying the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, and we're not preaching those sermons, not just on King Day That's or right. one year for Justice Sunday, but as the center of the gospel, That's right. then we actually are undermining the possibility to reshape the moral consciousness of this nation. No, that's that's, that's for which the church has to repent. I've been to major church denominational meetings, and I'm a denominational guy. I was a <laughs> moderator for my church denomination. I'm a church bureaucrat too. But I've been to major denominational meetings for meet five days, seven days, uh, two weeks sometimes. That's right. And not one sermon on poverty and wow. injustice. And, and yet it's the centerpiece of Jesus' ministry. Yeah, you know, I, th that's right. I, we, we like to say at EDS at Union, uh, social justice isn't the add-on, it is the gospel. And there's a reason that uh, the story tells us that Jesus was born in a manger uh, right. uh, with those people who were left out and marginalized. And that's the beginning of, of, of God's justice. And so... You are right. It begins with the most disenfranchised, with the poor, with the uh, major people, with whom Howard Thurman says, those with their backs against the wall, and I like to say, and have no wall upon which to lean their backs. That's I want to get you out on this. Well, let me let me so, tell you one thing with what you go, just said. Go so ahead. What go is ahead. That, so in a real sense, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival and repairs of the breach, one of the most important things we're doing now is reshaping the narrative. Because if you don't have. I, I think Bishop uh, Barbara, you just went out on us. Hello. Hello. Yeah, there you, hear you me? are. There you are. Yes, yeah, we can. I said, I said, one of the most important things we're doing in the past of breach, the poor people's campaign is getting the right narrative, the right facts. That's right. You know, when we started, people were telling us it wasn't but 39 million poor people in this country, mm -hmm. government officials. So when you operate on a lie or you or you allow the problem to be lessened, uh, when you don't talk about the fact that a quarter million people die every year from poverty right. before COVID, then That's there's right. no intensity, there's no intensity in what you're saying, as my grandma used to say, there ain't no nothing on it. Ain't no nothing on it because it ain't dealing with the truth, right? right? So part right. of what we're doing is reshaping the narrative because without the right narrative and prophetic imagination, you're never going to have the right prophetic right. implementation. Mm. Ruggerman talked about that. Uh, 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 um, Rabbi Heschel used to talk about the first role of the prophets 
is to tell the truth. Tell That's the, the truth. only way. To go. And so what's happening is, though, in the Poor People's Campaign, we recognize that all preaching is not to be done by those who who, who wear collars. Uh, right. In the days of Ezekiel, uh, when the land was right with injustice, and Ezekiel, God told Ezekiel, he said, the problem is that the pr politicians are like wolves. This is Ezekiel 22. Mm -hmm. He said, and the, and the priests are telling them things that I have not told them, which makes them act that way because they're not being challenged. Then so God tells Ezekiel, I need you to find a man who can stand in the gap. Well, he didn't, couldn't find one. But he then found this valley of dry bones. Mm -hmm. And God said, can these bones live? I like to say, can these bones live, talk, preach? Because the text <laughs> says the bones became this great army of articulation, That's right. Right? That's right? It became a voice. That's and right. so what we're trying to build in the campaign, first and foremost, is a voice. Right. A voice right. of millions of hundreds, and the voice coming from the people impacted because they are the greatest moral leaders and the moral voices. Now, we got really criticized, uh, and I thank God I love the Episcopalians that were there because you all didn't. Some people, you know, had the nerve to criticize us when we went June 18th. We had 150,000 people in the street, a right. couple million folk online. You know, some people said to me, well, yeah. you don't think you should come to D.C. and put ordinary people on the stage. Mm. When you come to DC, you let the leaders speak. No, and I, no. that's the problem. That's, a, that's, that's right. That's, the first that's right. We had impacted people putting a face on these numbers and a voice on these numbers, and every one of them ended that what they said, we won't be silent yeah. anymore. And yeah, and one of the things I've always liked about the Poor People's Campaign, Repairs of the Breach, is that you... Uh, don't talk about people and treat people as if they're statistics. You let the people uh, talk for themselves and you humanize uh, the fake people behind the numbers uh, mm -hmm. and that we aren't simply talking about numbers. We are talking about real, true human beings and they can tell their story if but we would provide a space and empower them and give them a the voice. I'm gonna, I let you out on this just real quick. We got two weeks. Midterms mm -hmm. are coming up. What can we do now wow. uh, as faith leaders, as community leaders to get the vote out so that we can realize the political power of the poor? Mm -hmm. What must we do now? First of all, recognize that your votes are not supports, they are demands. So mm -hmm. we need to be voting with the saying that we're voting on policy. You look at every candidate based on policy. Where do they stand in relationship to the poor, living wages, health care? Not talking about their party. Where do they stand? And then you vote, but you let them know. If I vote for you, you get in office. I'm expecting you to act. I'm not expecting you to get elected and then say, wait a minute, we got to be gradual. I, I'm convinced that part of the problem, and I know very well the difference between, you know, what we saw in Trump and them and, and the Democratic Party. But one of the great problems right now is we said to uh, uh, the Democrats, you all need to have at least two more votes before the election on living wages and voting rights, even if you lose, let America see mm -hmm. where people stand because then they can know how to vote when they go to the polls. Well, that didn't happen, but you can read, you can check it up, you can know where people stand. So get educated. Number two, we've got in the Poor People's Campaign, and you can go to our website right now and join an effort that we've been put on to reach 5 million voters in uh, 15 so-called battleground states. We're close to that 5 million. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that in those states, uh, that number of vo voters turned out can fundamentally shift. Uh, mm -hmm. Elections are being decided even in some southern states by less than 500 votes, sometimes less than 10,000. Uh, in my state, for instance, the, even the last presidential race, one million poor and low wealth people didn't vote, but the presidential election was determined by only 150,000 votes. Right. So you don't say what you don't have. Look at the power you do have. If third thing you can do, there's a, a tonight I'll be on Joy Reid, and we're going to be talking about another initiative that the uh, Poor People's Campaign, Repairs of Breach, Kairos, Legal Women Voters, um, uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, SEIU are joining where you can create circles of people in your own family 
and make sure that they are voting. Make sure we have an app that you can use to make sure we're turning out people. And then lastly, preachers preach. Preachers <laughs> preach, preach. These last two weeks, God knows, turn your pulpits loose. I'm preaching a national sermon on Sunday called We Know What, what to Do and Why We Have to Do It. Uh, and, 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 and calling on other pastors, uh, our sermon should be contextual now. That mm -hmm. we should be in, the, we should recognize the zits and laban that we're in, the, 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 the challenge to the soul of this country, where we are. And we're not talking about electing Jesus. We don't have to do that. You know, uh, we don't elect mm -hmm. Jesus, but we at least ought to look down the list of policies and know that if, if someone is pushing, is saying, uh, uh, my policy is uh, blocking living wages, uh, blocking health care, suppressing the vote, pushing violence, uh, hating gay people, uh, taking away women's rights, that that's not anywhere even near anything that would look like a Jesus agenda. And so if I'm a Jesus person or God person, why would I be over there supporting that? Not to say that the other people are perfect. We're not voting for perfection. We're looking at policy. And so I want to say to everybody that's listening to you, if you got a pulpit, a radio program, a podcast, a, a, a tin can with a string on the end of it, <laughs> a, a, a smoke signal, a whatever you have. And, and let's, let's stop for one moment mourning about the Trump lie, as bad as he is, the lie didn't start with Trump. He inherited the lie. He charismatized the added violence to it. But this whole business of polarization is older than him. But if it was planned, it, if, if there was a plan to polarize, we can have a plan to unify. If it was a plan to divide, we can have a plan to bring people together. And lastly, uh, uh, um, the lie doesn't have to stand forever. The lie cannot be more powerful than the truth. And so for a moment, I want folk to do what, I want them to hear a question Jesus asked. You remember that man, uh, uh, Dean, he was at the pool. Mm. And, uh, do you, yep, and Jesus do you tell said, it. Do you want to be Do me? you want to be, oh. that's right. And it sounds like a harsh question, doesn't it? Like, what do you mean? Man, is all this misery, all this pain, all this sickness, all this smell. But Jesus still asked the question, and I believe three things. Number one, I believe Jesus believed in inch deliverance. In other words, that he could have inched uh, 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 every hour for a year and gotten close enough to the edge of the pool to fall <laughs> over there when the angel came by. Number two, I believe that Jesus believed in pulling one another together ministry, that all of the poor folk could have, and sick folk could have got together and pulled one another over to the edge and then threw themselves in with the angel. So that there was not so much, they, it's not that they didn't have a way of deliverance. For some reason, the misery had beat them down to the point that they didn't have a will. And when, the, and when Jesus asked that question, it did, the man said, nobody, I don't have anybody. And it's interesting that what Jesus said is it's almost like he said, I know what I asked you. Right. He said, I'm saying, are you willing to start organizing? Start organizing that map like you don't have to be here. Yeah. I was saying, so start organizing these votes like you don't have to be here. <laughs> well, you know what? That's a good uh, note to end on. And what you remind us, you've always spoken about. Uh, the moral revolution, and that moral revolution begins with us. And within these next two weeks, it begins with us organizing our votes, organizing our voice, changing the narrative, and allowing, as you say, the truth to overwhelm the lie, as it always does. God's truth always stands. Reverend Dr. William Barber, thank you not simply for this conversation, Thank you for your work. Thank you for your moral voice. Thank you for your moral witness. And I ask all who listen and all who are engaged in this just conversation this afternoon to let us just all get on the arc that bends toward justice so yes. that we can indeed have this moral revolution that creates a more just society. Thank you. Reverend Barber, for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Forward together, not one step back. That's right. Thank you.